Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with another in our series of interesting overtures. And believe me when I tell you, there is no overture more interesting than Beethoven's overture to the consecration of the house. Wow. Now, the consecration of the house was composed in 1822. It was written for a performance of the same play as The Ruins of Athens. It was written for the dedication of a new theater, and The Ruins of Athens is this awful allegorical sort of mishmash that talks about how wonderful a city is and its buildings, and it was supposed to make Vienna out to be the new Athens, and it wasn't really about Athens or ruins, or it just... Who cares? It's completely unimportant. What matters is the music Beethoven wrote. Now, the Ruins of Athens Overture is just awful. It's really Beethoven's worst overture. It's a prelude, and it's very ineffective or ineffectual. It does have a couple good tunes, though, that come back later in vocal settings. Anyway, that's not what we're talking about. The Consecration of the House. Yes. Why is it so important? Well, it's really the only major orchestral work by Beethoven that we have from his late period, aside from the ninth. That's all we've got. And of course, the Mrs. Solemnis, which is chorus and orchestra. So it's very, very important. And at this phase of his life, Beethoven had made an extensive study of Bach and Handel, and this overture he describes sort of as something in the Handelian vein, and it was going to be uh, full of counterpoint as a result, because he regarded those composers as contrapuntists, above all, and he wanted to write something that was sort of monumental, but also was Beethovenish. And Beethoven was, of course, the ultimate dramatic composer, that is dramatic in terms of sonata form, the dynamic expression of movement and activity toward a goal in sound. And Baroque music is just the opposite of that. Baro Baroque music is rhetorical. It's about standing in one place and shouting about something, but you don't go anywhere. And so Beethoven's late works, things like the Hammerklavier Sonata with its fugal finale, or the late string quartets with their mixture of sonata form movements and fugal movements and counterpoint and all of the stuff that he did also in the great choral works of the era, you know, these are all indicative of his fascination with the contrast between what we might call drama, sonata form, that is goal-directed music, and rhetoric, music which isn't necessarily goal-directed, but which is massive, and music which has, it's rhetorical. You know what rhetorical means. It means it makes points. It makes a point by standing in one place and talking, essentially. It's oratorical, or or orational, or I don't know, whatever it is. Anyway, the point is, that's what this overture does. And it does it in the most entertaining possible way. And the only way to really get your brain around it is to just take it apart, piece by piece. The structure could not be simpler, even though it's very weird. It's a triple introduction, that is three separate introductions, um, each with a different kind of feel to them. And then, and then there's the big fugue in the middle. And you know what a fugue is, right? A fugue is simply the same tune, or subject as it's called, played in a certain number of parts, one after the other, just like an around, with little episodes in the middle. And you use that to construct a gigantic musical edifice in multiple simultaneous parts, all going along at the same time. And we'll get to that in a moment. And then there is a coda. And the coda is huge. Figure, figure it this way. Think of it as timing. The whole overture is about 10 minutes long, at least in this marvelous performance that we're going to be listening to um, with the Minnesota Orchestra under Stanislav Skorbachevsky on Fox. This is a great set. All the Beethoven overtures, it's marvelous. Anyway, in this performance, it is 10 minutes and 26 seconds. Now, of that 10 minutes and 26 seconds, about four and a half is the introduction or the three introductions. About three and a bit, three and 20 seconds or so is the fugue. And two and a half minutes is the coda, the ending. And so it falls into very, very clearly defined chunks. And we're going to take it one chunk at a time. 
because listening in chunks is very helpful in a work like this. So, and I'm not going to play the whole thing and put it back together. That's up to you to go listen to it. Because, first of all, I mean, we're going to listen to all of it in chunks. And so there, if we listen to it all again, it's just going to add 10 minutes to the length of the video. And you can go and listen at your leisure. But the first, now let's talk first about the introductory bits. All right. Now, the introduction consists first of a march, which is logical, right? It's a grand thing. It's a dedication of a major edifice. And so it begins with a march that starts in the distance and gets closer and closer until it becomes this grand statement. Did you notice the trombones at the end of each phrase? Da, 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 da. You know, they always echo the trombones. That's the only thing the trombones do in the whole overture. They have these little three-note echoes after each phrase. Da, 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 ba, ba, da, da. Ya, da, da, ba, ba, da, da, trombones. Ya, da, da, da. That's all they do. And then they stop and they don't play another note in the whole overture. So they go away. Trombones. Now, this march ends with a, an inaugural celebratory fanfare in trumpets and timpani with the strangest bassoon part anyone ever wrote. Beethoven always gave the bassoon strange parts that are very hard to hear. There's one, there's one also at the end of the development section in the first movement of the Emperor Concerto, which nobody ever <laughs> manages to hear, because it's like somewhere under the music. And that was just a characteristic of Beethoven's writing. You know, there are weird little bass lines and things. There's also that solo cello under the rondo theme in the finale of Beethoven's fourth piano concerto. You know, you just, you just strange little things whipping in and out. Well, these are the strangest. Because under the fanfare, which is marked fortissimo for the two trumpets and timpani, the bassoons start doing these crazy octave runs. Tovey described them as the sound of hurrying feet. It's almost impossible to hear the bassoon part in real life in a concert unless you really tamp down the trumpets and drums or make them sound like they're in the distance or do something so that you can hear the bassoons doing... It's, it's, it's absolutely insane. And in a recording, at least you can mic it so that they're closer and you can hear them um, through the trumpets and drums. And sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. Recordings differ. In this performance, you do hear them. And so here is the fanfare. It's like so far so normal, right? You've got a march, and then you have a celebratory fanfare with the sound of hurrying feet, possibly people rushing to get into the theater to see the play. But I don't think that's true because the play really sucked, and no one was in a hurry to see this play. Believe me, nobody was rushing. It isn't the way things worked back in those days, and it certainly wasn't the way things worked with a junky play about the, the, the you know, sort of... You know, 
a symbolic wonderfulness of Vienna. At least I don't think. I, I can't imagine somebody hurrying. And besides, they didn't have deodorant and toilet paper and everybody stank and the whole thing was probably just disgusting. So anyway, or they didn't notice. I don't know. You get the fanfare. So then, after the fanfare dies down, we get this really strange quasi-fugal, meaning it, you know, it, it is contrapuntal. It has a little tune that one section of the orchestra repeats after the other, and it's under this very regular metronomic tramping rhythm like Rossini's Barber of Seville Overture, you know, jump, 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 da 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 ba 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 da you know, like that. It sounds like that. And it very well may express Beethoven's annoyance at the popularity of Rossini, because he was very annoyed at the popularity of Rossini, who had taken Vienna by storm. And it's entirely possible that he was just pissed. And so he decided to write a, an abortive fugue, a this is how it's not supposed to be done type introductory fugal thing. But I think the important thing about this little bit of introduction is that he's starting to get away from the simple march and the fanfare and move towards something more sophisticated, only it's just not there yet. So here is the fake fugue thing, the, the, the pissed at Rossini moment. Here it is. <laughs> So, having gotten that off of his chest, the orchestra sort of stops for a minute. See me scratching my nose like this? I actually have an itch, but so does the orchestra. That's exactly what the orchestra does. And without further ado, suddenly, you know, it begins quizzically with a few a little hesitation. All of a sudden, boom, we're in the middle of this big orchestral fugue based on a, a very simple tune. It's basically a descending scale. And there's a what they call a counter subject, which is just another tune that is also treated contrapuntally, and it's just a descending scale. It's all sort of the same thing. And that goes whipping away, whizzing away all over the place for three and a half minutes. And it's furiously full of energy and it's just marvelous. I mean, it's absolutely thrilling and exhilarating. It really is. It has so much energy and life and vigor. It's, it's really an extraordinary piece of writing. And I need to be very clear about this and caution you before we listen to it. Orchestral fugues are very different very different from like, you know, Bach's keyboard fugues and like the well-tempered clavier or organ fugues or ones for just a fixed number of parts, like four parts or three parts or two parts that remain clear throughout the fugue because an orchestra can't, can't work that way. 
An orchestra's got all these people. <laughs> you, have to, you have to give them something to do. And so Beethoven has trumpets and drums. They, they're too limited. They're not going to be able to play the tune, but they can play rhythm. So they go bum, 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 dum, bum, 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 dum, bum, bum. So you've got the rhythm section. <laughs> you've got lots of strings and, and, and four or five parts. Plus you have your woodwinds and horns and... And there are just too many people out there. So orchestral fugues are never going to maintain the clarity of part writing, that transparency of contrapuntal texture that you hear in keyboard root fugues or fugues for the string quartet, where you only have four parts and four players. There's all kinds of filler and stuff whizzing around, which can make them even more exciting and more massive, because Beethoven's point here is to build something Remember, this is the dedication of a building. Well, here is the description of the building. And it, it's, a, it's a big, massive sort of fugal edifice. And here it is.
I just think that's some of the most thrilling and exhilarating music anybody ever wrote. It has so much energy. But here's the point. Here's the really cool thing about it. Fugues can have all the energy in the world, but as I said, they're rhetorical. They're a discussion of a specific theme or subject. And so they don't evolve. They don't head towards anything. They just kind of get bigger and more contrapuntally inter intricate. And Beethoven shows us this. He tells us that however amazing this fugue is, however much energy it has, that energy can't go anywhere. And he tells us this in an amazing middle section for the fugue. Maybe you heard it. It's the part where the music gets stuck. It's like a record with a stuck needle. Remember those? Remember records? Remember needles? You put them on, they would like keep playing the same thing over and over again. It would get stuck. It can't go on. And so the music it hits a plateau. It's a wonderful moment because he's, he's, it, 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 it's rhetorical. He's saying to us, see, here I am and I'm stuck. Here's that moment. And it, it finally arrives at a conclusion, which is transparent in a minor key. It's transparently somewhere else from where it started. And the only thing the music can do is start the fugue over again. And it does. Here's that moment. I, set, I excerpted it separately because I just want you to hear just how graphic and, and clearly Beethoven is describing the art of going nowhere right here. So, the few comes to an end as on this sort of Handelian trill for full orchestra, and then we have the coda. Now, the coda, as I said, is two and a half minutes long. Why is it so huge? Well, I, the answer, I think, is pretty clear. Beethoven has built up this enormous structure, and he's done it with just a volcanic amount of rhythmic energy. The music is full of energy, but it's frustrated. It's frustrated because it hasn't gone anywhere and it wants to go somewhere. You know, you've seen the building. Now, now you want to do something. You want to celebrate in some way. You want to do something that's, that's going to release all of that energy that's been accumulating through the entire three and a half or so minutes of the fugue. And so the coda achieves exactly that. The coda is nothing but a big, long search for the ending. And as typical with Beethoven's codas, I mean, the most famous being the end of the Fifth Symphony, you keep thinking it's going to end, but it doesn't. I mean, all of a sudden it veers off in another direction and then it tries to end again. Then it goes in another direction and then it tries to end again. And finally, at long last, after many crescendos and decrescendos and fake outs and climaxes, it finally gets to the end with the fugue subject. And by the time that ending arrives, you just want to go, oh, you should be sweating. It's just thrilling. And you're so relieved that it actually got there because there was no guarantee at any point in this overture that it was going to get there. And when it does finally get there, you just think to yourself, oh my God, how marvelous we've arrived. So here is the coda.
And with that, we arrive at last at the predestined ending. Well, was it predestined or did it just fortuitously manage to figure out where it was going at the last minute? That, my friends, is for you to decide. I just adore this piece. It is because it's such a such a strange formal entity, it actually has more opportunities for interpretation than almost any other short orchestral work by Beethoven. I mean, every section of the of the introduction can have its own tempo. The fugue has so many auxiliary parts and bits of orchestration that you can emphasize. And the coda, of course, has got to simply slay ya. It's got to be thrilling at the end. I, I mean, I, when you listen to performances of it, and I've listened to a billion, um, it's amazing how many different ways there are to play this overture and how changing the shape and proportion changes our perception of the whole. But this performance with Skrovachevsky and the Minnesota Orchestra on Vox is just wonderful. It's one of the great ones, but more importantly, this is one of the great overtures, certainly one of the most interesting overtures and an absolute masterpiece. So keep on listening, folks. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.